Will you give a warm welcome, please, to Karen and to Kevin? So I'm going to test the voice without the microphone. Can you hear me fine no. without? No. no. Is that better? Oh, yes. Better? Yes. Thank you, Julie. Thank you to the Women's Club of New Seabury. This has been very generous, a great lunch. 51 years for the New Seabury Women's Club. And it started out with five women. I did my homework on you. <laughs> and it started out as a social, a, a small social group. It still is, but it's a much larger group of about 100 members now. And you do a lot of uh, nonprofit, community-based, you're very uh, generous with your donations to these groups. Service Center being one of them, and thank you very much for that. My partner, Kevin Doyle, who I could not have done this without his enthusiasm and his passion, and um, he's a great teacher, lover of history. Um, so we're, we're fortunate to uh, have been able to collaborate on something so special. But I have to go back to 1994, and the whole reason for this book was the commissioning of that piece, the first Thanksgiving painting. I'm convinced, given all that's transpired since and the information that we've been able to uncover and that we had uh, in our hands, that the book never would have come about without the commission of the painting. So let me just take you back a little bit to 1994 with the commission, and then we'll move forward with our introduction of all our slides. So in 1994, I received a commission from the National Association of Congregational Christian Churches based out in Wisconsin, Oak Creek, Wisconsin. And the uh, the parts of the, the commission that were pretty involved and a little daunting, one was they wanted this to be, from their congregation, a gift to the nation. It had to be historically accurate. It had to have the population of the pilgrims, 52 pilgrims, and the natives that were at the Thanksgiving feast, the 90 natives, 91, including Massasoit. It had to be done in a period of time that would also accommodate them with their anniversary. They were having a 40th anniversary. So the commission came in in uh, late summer of 94, and now I had to make a decision if I would accept this, this commission. And my first reaction was, I don't know that much about the first Thanksgiving, except for what I learned in fourth grade history. And with any commission, there's a responsibility. And something like this, it's a pretty overwhelming presentation to be put in your hands. And so I thought, I don't know if this can even be achieved. I don't know if there's information that will even get me to step one. So I, before I accepted, I went to do my research and I talked with people at Pilgrim Hall Museum, the Museum of the Pilgrims. I researched at Plymouth Plantation. I did some research in the local library. And as I started to talk with different individuals, I thought, like a forensic scientist, you will pull one piece of the puzzle at a time and it, and it may, you may have the ability to actually create this, this piece. And I knew it was an important piece, but I had no idea the impact that it would literally have on the world. So I accept the commission, and I continue with the research, and I start the painting process in the, um, let's see, it must have been the, the fall, the spring. So I went through late summer, winter, spring, now I'm painting, and completing it in the summer of 95. The historical accuracy part of this took place on a tracing that was three by five feet. That had to be signed off by the historians. 
I never said it was a historically accurate piece. This came from the historians. So now we have a historically accurate representation of the first Thanksgiving. And now I can take it to the next step of addressing the canvas. So we have at the Falmouth Historical Society this three by five drawing on tracing paper. It's been framed, it's behind plexiglass. And I had it on display at the gallery just for a brief period of time. And this is an interesting comment because in looking at it, one would think that it's you know, quite old. And so this person came in and he looked at it and he said, wow, it's amazing how well preserved something going back to the 1600s is. And I said, actually, sir, it was done in 1994. But so that's on display with the original. Uh, great vision of the uh, director there, uh, Mark Schmidt, at the Falmouth Historical Society. Um, he said, I have nothing to lose. I have everything to gain by getting the painting he had of Falmouth during the 400th commemoration of the Mayflower. And so Mark wrote to them. He got permission. The painting arrived. And as I said, then COVID hit and they were building a room for it. And when the exhibit is through, they'll have another additional space for further exhibitions. So uh, we're going to move forward with uh, our, our slide presentation for you. That's a little bit of the background on the painting. There is, there is more to the painting, and we'll be talking about that as well. Uh, but I'd like to give uh, Kevin a little opportunity at, at the microphone at this point. And, um, and then we'll be talking about different portions of our book that's written in a vignette style, so it's very easy to pick up a chapter, go back to it. And uh, so here we show the 1621, the painting, and the pencil piece is off to the left. This was in a temporary housing that they had in the Conan House on the property of the Falmouth Historical Society. And I will just add, when you go to see it, it really will take your breath away. You, know, you don't see the true colors the way, it, the way it pops out. You can see the pencil tracing that uh, Karen introduced first, and then how she translated it into the oil painting. You know, one other thing I'll mention is, um, described as a visual historian and Kevin as a, a writer, there's a lot of similarities that go into the creative process in the fact of being a, a visual uh, historian, you are creating in images what the writer is saying in words. You're creating in shapes and forms and visual impact what the writer is trying to convey in concise and very special language. I would like to come into uh, Plymouth and see your name up in on that band. Pretty, pretty impressive, huh? Uh, that's what, that's one of the first time as soon as she was finished with it before it went to uh, the Plymouth Plantation. Uh, another use of it, when Karen said it's been seen all over the world and certainly all over the country, we have people walk into the gallery and it's really kind of interesting when they say, oh yeah, I saw that in my high school uh, textbook. Uh, if you look at this teaching American history without masterpieces, you know, Washington crossing the Delaware, uh, you've seen the uh, Plains Indians over here, that's the Trail of Tears. Uh, being uh, exhibited up on the left hand, upper left, Grant Woods down there, Paul Revere, and of course there's, there's Ronaldo. Uh, and I have to add that there's something very humbling about walking into the Pilgrim <laughs> Hall Museum, the Museum of the Pilgrims, uh, and you realize the intensity and the extreme responsibility that you have in telling a story, and telling it as accurate as possible and also as the writer, telling the story as accurate as possible, and what we went through to try to achieve that. It has to be accurate. This room is full of teachers. See, <laughs> here's the, uh, the, the, the teaching guide that went through teaching uh, uh, history through art, a uh, series of questions and so forth. Then we come up to the uh, story itself, and I get the first part at uh, telling the pilgrim story. But I like to start the Pilgrim story with the Holy Roman Empire. So don't feel too bad about going to order supper in. Uh, 
in, in, in the, 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 the reason I decided the Holy Roman Empire is year 800, uh, Europe is basically Catholic as a result of all that. Uh, and things go along for centuries until long about uh, uh, 13, 1500, 1517, when Martin Luther in Germany says, too many things going wrong. The church is trying to be both civic and religious at the same time. So you end up with the uh, 95 theses in Germany at, at the Wittenberg uh, Chapel. A couple of decades later, uh, you have John Calvin, a uh, French theologian, who says the same thing. He said, no, things are wrong here. Uh, that's not the way it should be. The thing that tipped England was King Henry VIII. And King Henry VIII now uh, is married to Catherine of Aragon for 20 years, and he's childless. And so he says, well, this won't do. I don't have an heir to the English throne. I need, a, I need an heir. So he goes to the Pope, and he says, I need a new wife. And the Pope says, no, you can't do that. And so Henry VIII says, well, fool me to that. I'll just start my own religion then. And he does. And so you have uh, the Church of England. Less than 100 years into it, people start looking at the Church of England and say, well, this isn't any much better. Uh, you know, we look at the Bible. And if it isn't in the Bible, it shouldn't be in the liturgy. And so a, a number of people start thinking that way. And they break off. And they start, practice, they start practicing their religion in their cellars or in, the, in a neighbor's house and gathering together in smaller congregations where if they're found, they'll be tortured or tormented or you know, reprimanded. So they say, well, this won't work either. It's time to make, make tracks. Let's go to Holland. Holland is far more uh, accepting. And so in 1607, this group out from Scrooby up in uh, the northwestern part, of, northeastern part of England, starts to make tracks over to, over to Holland. This is Amsterdam. Amsterdam is a big city. It's like going from here to Boston. Why would you do that? So they get to, they get to the city, uh, to Amsterdam. They stay there for about two years. And they say, well, about 40 miles south of here is a beautiful town called Leiden. Uh, it, too, is a city that's a couple of hundred years old. It has beautiful brick buildings. It has towering uh, uh, church steeples and so forth. And so they go down there. Now they've gone from about 10 years from, from England. And I just would interject yeah. that the king, in his anarchy, a state of anarchy and turmoil and persecution, the desperateness then of the, well, they're not called pilgrims at that point, but of the people to have to leave, to feel they must leave. Very good. Yeah, they, they were. They, they, they did feel that they had to leave from England. Uh, and Karen says they weren't pilgrims then, but, but in some ways they were. Uh, you know, if you go back to the Canterbury Tales, 1300, uh, in, in, in the Canterbury Tales, if you recall the prologue, it's, it happens in April when it's been raining, one that opera with the short of soap, the, the, the very wet uh, showers of April. But I'm longing folk to go on, on pilgrimages. And in Ferna Howley's, uh, from Ferna Howley's, I know what it says. <laughs> but I didn't memorize it. You did 50 years ago. 50 I'm years very ago. impressed. Yeah, there you go. And, uh, and especially from every shared end of England to Canterbury they went. So they were used to making these pilgrimages, and they would go to Canterbury, all part of the Church of England, uh, to see the Archbishop down there, the Archbishop of Canterbury. So in some ways, this is making the, the uh, pilgrimage now uh, to, uh, to Holland and then probably to uh, America. In fact, they were on the base of uh, William Bradford's statue. It says they knew they were pilgrims right there in the middle. Uh, you know, some people attribute the word pilgrims to the 1800s, but you know, they knew what they were doing that in the pilgrimage. This was, was actually something when they, they were did. leaving Delft's Haven, and he makes this comment that they knew they were pilgrims. So this is the journey they make. They leave from Holland, stop by England on the way to uh, refit the ship Speedwell. It doesn't do so well, so everybody crams into the Mayflower, where now they have pilgrims. They have these people who are actually leaving the church. Uh, and then also they had merchants. They had a couple of those, and they had strangers, and they had the military component as well. So out of the 100 people that were on the uh, Mayflower, probably about half of them were actually the pilgrims and the rest were used uh, for security and to fill up the ship. So there they are, they're crossing the ocean, and just as they approach Provincetown, having been at sea, at sea for uh, two, two months, 
uh, 60, about 60 days out, uh, they run into a storm just as they're approaching the arm of the Cape, and it blows them off course, it blows them north. They were actually aiming for, uh, for New York City. They weren't going down to, uh, to Jamestown, they didn't want to get down there, they wanted to have their own area in the Northern Virginia uh, tract. So they get blown off course, and they start to round Monomoy. Well, as we all know in this room, you don't round Monomoy. Uh, if you're going south, you better go down to about New Jersey before you turn, or you're going to run aground. So they turn around, and uh, they say, well, there's a, there's a safe haven right up here in Provincetown. Let's turn around and go back up there. This is the ship, of course. Uh, the Mayflower, which is beautiful. How many saw it uh, going through the canal? Anybody get to see it yet? Yeah. Couple. That was quite an emotional thing to see yeah. it go through with, with all the boats that were surrounding it. So how do they know where to go? Because Book Gosnold had been here already. We know, we know who he is, and he was here in 1602. He had charted the course already, so they, they had some idea of what the coastline would look like and where they were going to go. We're going to tell the story according as, it, as it's been told by Mort's relation, which is kind of an interesting term. It's an old, ter old, uh, old, old time expression. It was basically a journal that somebody was relating uh, to this fellow Mort, who is, remains unknown to history, exactly who it is. But it's a journal. So everything that, that we say is what the pilgrim said as it was happening. Well, I think Mort's relation is um, a, di a diary, journal, however you want to look at that, but I think it's the immediacy of the way things were written, entering in what was happening at that moment, that get gives it great legitimacy. I think this is you. you want to take this? Ah, okay. So we have now the pilgrim. Oh, I want to just back up to their, on their journey, their, uh, into their journey coming across to the New World, uh, they have had their religious uh, conversations with Reverend Robinson back in Leiden. And I think Reverend Robinson had a big impact on the, uh, on the people, on the pilgrims. So now they're coming over and they're landing at Provincetown. There are two, two English children who are born. Oceanus is born on the trip across, and Peregrine is born actually in, in Provincetown. And so we have the first landing, we have some photographs of the uh, marker. This is the approximate location of where they say that, that the Mayflower would have landed, the breakwater at, at the far end uh, beyond Commercial Street. And of course, the Pilgrim Monument. We have a couple of photographs of that. And then we come to the Mayflower Compact, what Kevin will be talking about, but I'll just inject, inject here that I believe it was the words that stayed in the mind of the pilgrims um, and as very inspirational to them from Reverend Robinson. I believe that he inspired the Mayflower Compact. It certainly is an inspired document, and that's what it looks like. Uh, and this is... Uh the, the thing that we see celebrated in many monuments, and you've seen, you seen different pictures and so forth. Here it is in relief, uh, which is at the foot of the Forefathers Monument, which was erected uh, 100 years ago as part of the 300th anniversary. Uh, we see it at the base of the Pilgrim Monument, right there in relief, and a close-up of that. Uh, and of course, not Carver, necessarily... Carver uh, had a, a pen in this. I think he had a hand in the writing of the compact. Yeah, here you'll see a mother and a child over here, a mother and a child over there. You'll see a woman standing right here. That probably isn't the way it was. Uh, just in the, the AC Miles Standish and his, his military regalia. Uh, but, but this was an intention to show there were the 41 adults, the 41 males, uh, signed their signatures to the Mayflower Compact. Uh, and if, if there was an equality of gender, there certainly was an equality across castes, which was very unusual, because servants signed this as well as masters. Uh, it, was, it was all for one, one for all. The words are, are these, and I think that the key to the words 
goes right across here, that they combine themselves together into a civil body politic for the better ordering and preservation and enact such just and equal laws for the general good and we promise all due submission and obedience. This is right out of the congregation. This is the way they talk to each other. The, the congregation says love one another. The American way. Uh, and, and it becomes the language that they use here, as Karen said, Reverend Robinson, I think the words are inspired themselves. From this, we see a majority rule. It's all for one and one for all. It's whatever the rules are. They knew they were going to be independent. They knew they had to be self-sufficient, but they were not going to have a monarchy, but they couldn't have, have monarchy either, have, a, have the anarchy. So I think that's really the basis of the American spirit, right then and there. Now we'll kind of follow the landings. So the first touchdown was at uh, Provincetown, and they have three, they call them discoveries, uh, one being at uh, the Pilgrim Lake area, Pilgrim Spring, where they have their first sip of spring water, fresh water, and water was a vital part of their existence. By the time, by the time they arrived at P Provincetown, uh, Bradford makes this almost like a soliloquy statement, and he, he gazes off and back and forth at, at this group of people, and he says they were weather beaten, they were exhausted, they were starving, um, they had no idea what they were in for, um, and they were coming up on winter, which was a treacherous time, there were no inns to take them in. There were no, they had no friends, no family. They had left all of this. They had given this all up. And so now water becomes a very uh, precious thing. And, and water can be tainted and uh, it can be poisonous. But they found some, a fresh spring. So this was a, a vital part of their nutrition. Um, this is one of the pathways going down to a marker that you'll see in the suggesting, suggested yeah. spot of where this might be. Of course, they are questioning that this is the spring area, that maybe it's already gone yes. out to sea. But there's the marker with a little plaque on it. There's the spring. Yeah. And the second, uh, they're traversing all the land escape here, and they make, a, this is an approach to Corn Hill. The typical landscape, and in the in the far background is Corn Hill. So this is the approach to it. And on the left are a couple of markers. And so they the ground is still uh, that they can dig, and they see some corn, and, and they take some corn with the uh, with the promise to uh, make good on, on what they're doing. So they, we digged up a great kettle full of very fair corn. If we could find any of the people, we would give them the kettle again and satisfy them for their corn, which place we called Corn Hill. And they're always giving praise to God. Uh, and sure, it was God's good providence that we would found, found this corn, for else we know not how we should have done. So as soon as we can meet conveniently with them, we will give them full satisfaction, which they did. And now we come to the first encounter, and I'll make a comment here before Kevin takes the microphone. This particular view inspired a lot of the work, inspired all of the work, actually, that I did for the 400th committee up in East Ham. And at the far, far point where the uh, little Rick laser is, is the first encounter beach. So this particular view, when we saw this, it started all of the artwork that progressed forward. So, This was done by Shala. And I think the next one is, is the Shala. Oh. There's the boat right there. And that's, that's being re, uh, reworked right now. That picture is taken up at Lowell's boat shop up, in, up on the uh, Kennebec, uh, excuse me, on the Merrimack River. Uh, it's the oldest continuing boat shop. And if you see the barn doors on the left, you can tell it's been around for a while. 1792 or something like that. Uh, and this, this Shala was made in the 50s. Uh, in Mystic, based upon the uh, documentation that they had available for what the Charlotte would look like. It was carried in the hold of the Mayflower. 
uh, was carried in two parts and uh, reassembled by the ship's carpenter once they arrived. So the first two spots that they stopped, the, the, the spring and then into the uh, Corn Hill, that was by foot. Now they could sail. And so that's why they're in the shallow. Yeah, and, they're, they're and it's interesting because I call this like the first prefab construction. <laughs> it's in two pieces. They actually, the pilgrims would use this as a sleeping quarters. There was no privacy on the crammed quarters of the boat. And so they would use this to snuggle into. And when Karen talks about the artwork, she was commissioned to do this uh, piece right here, showing the shallop at the shore at uh, First Encounter Beach. That's what they use up in uh, East Ham right now for the 400th. If you go to the beach, you'll see this uh, rather weather-beaten sign showing this is the sign of the first, the first encounter on December 8th, 1620, and it has the names of the 17 uh, pilgrims or, or military Miles Standish is on that list and so forth. Uh, that was placed there again for the 300th anniversary. You know, here we are at the 400th, and they're really, aside from our book, I'd like to say, I'm not sure what, what, what is left that's uh, really got, got uh, anything to it. A lot was done in 1920, and not that much is being done in 2020. Uh, back about 20 years ago, this is the Wampanoag equivalent. We had that, uh, uh, the Pilgrim Monument up there since uh, for 100 years. In some place, do you know what it was, Deja? Was it, uh, it was about 20 years ago. It's down here, but it's hard to read it. Uh, this is the name of the same 17 folks. But this talks, this says the Wampanoag Nation seeking uh, to, to preserve their, their culture. And when Karen and I wrote the book, we, we talk about this as being an encounter yeah, to save two, two cultures. cultures. Yeah. An inevitable encounter. We'll, we'll have that. Uh, again, going back to the Mort's relation, as soon as they left, as they're sailing away, uh, Edward Winslow records, after we had given God thanks, we took our shallop and went on our journey and called this place the first encounter. And we talked about what a great term that was. Here they, they had a short, it lasted about 15 minutes. Uh, and you had marksmen on both sides. You had, you had the Wampanoags who were very good with the bow and arrow. They obviously, they hunted rabbits for the bow and arrow. They knew how to use it. You had folks on this side with the blunderbuss. You can't miss anything with the blunderbuss. You know, you aim it, you're gonna hit it. No one was hurt. No one was killed. You know, when you talk about divine intervention, I think that was a piece of it. And I think that the language that they used was also very important. They called it an encounter. They didn't call it a battle, they didn't call it a war, they didn't call it. So I think that this was the first step to preserving two cultures. You know, it, it's very specific language, which I'm um, impressed with throughout the story. But uh, getting back to the natives and um, their training, uh, military training, um, I think it almost went against their philosophy, perhaps, that they didn't want to shed blood, or on any occasion they would do the most they could not to shed blood. So that's another part of maybe why they, they didn't have any uh, catastrophe of battle there. And they had, as they said, the encounter, first encounter. This is the uh, montage that Karen made for her, again, she was commissioned by them to do this 400th commemoration, and you see the map that you've seen repeatedly here. Some of the elements that you find up in, uh, up in East Ham right now, the old schoolhouse, the windmill, and so forth, if you go to up there. It's hard to find Wampanoag. People say, well, you know, all we have is all, all these things from the colonist side. That was what was substantial. What we are fortunate to have is the Indian rock. And up there, and you'll see little striations in the rock right here on the top which Karen has highlighted. That's where the Wampanoags would come down and sharpen their tools, and in some cases sharpen the uh, antlers off of a deer or something like that if they were using that for a, a cutting implement or as a war piece. Uh, and there, of course, you have the, the, uh, the shallop right there at the base of that cliff. Uh, and then the native uh, foliage and so forth, cranberries right down there and, and so forth. And so that view at the top is, is highlighting that photograph that you saw earlier. But one of the um, parts of, of this piece was they didn't want to show any uh, physical element of people 
And so to, with a subliminal message, a subliminal image, um, I countered that by showing the smoke rising up out of the dunes and a suggestion then of an encampment of life, of something going on there. And Karen was asked to do that because of the things he had done during the bicentennial, 1976. Uh, as Julie said at the beginning, there's something about every Cape Cod town. Karen did one of these for each of the 15 towns uh, on Cape Cod, and, and, and she was asked to replicate some of those elements into the, uh, into the bicentennial piece, where you will see some familiar things. Yeah, so but interestingly, from, from that period of time in 1976, Karen. So in 1976, um, I had created this book called Cape Cod 200 for the Bicentennial. And it has all the 15 Cape Cod towns, which now we reproduce in, our, in the wake of the Mayflower book, all in color. It was absolutely prohibitive to print in color. And so it gives it a nice awakening, so to speak, now to see all those images in color. Yeah, it really was. I was very happy to see that. We call it the inevitable encounter. Yes, it was the first encounter, but it, whether it happened on the shore of East Ham or if it happened in Lexington or any place else, or whether it happened in Boston or, or Salem or any place else, <coughs> inevitable. You know, it's a new world to us. It's home ownership, cultivate the land, advancement of Christianity, honor the king, laws and ordinance and constitutions. We're Englishmen. We'll call this area New England. Aha. But it's also an ancient land. It's a tribal territory. It's hunting grounds, the Great Spirit, summer camp, winter camp, sachems, graves, corn, squash, and beans, wildfowl. We call it Nasset. So the clash of cultures was inevitable. How the clash would be resolved would determine the success of this attempt of the English to colonize in the land called America. Now, we had been here before. We know the story of uh, Jamestown. Jamestown was not a success. I mean, it survived, but it wasn't a success. They were all on their way home when Lord Delaware showed up and uh, brought, brought in reinforcements and food and so forth. Uh, we, you may be familiar also with the Lost Colony, 1594 in North Carolina, uh, where the uh, Croatan uh, is the only word that's left, and so there was a tribe of what we don't know, but they were wiped out. We survived, and we survived thanks to a treaty with, uh, with Massasoit and with the, with the Wampanoag Indians. Otherwise, we wouldn't have survived at all. We'll talk about that. And interesting, because Carver was part of the compact, and Carver was present in part of the peace treaty, which took place then like six or seven months before the first Thanksgiving celebration. So here we are at Plymouth Rock, and you probably heard, you know, this was just defaced again uh, two days ago. Uh, it's really a shame what is happening. Uh, you've, all been, you've all seen Plymouth Rock. What's really kind of fun is that it's under this portico. That was also a gift from 100 years ago. Uh, we didn't even attempt anything on this scale this year uh, for the 400th anniversary, but at the 300th they did that. And if you ever go, spend just a few minutes you, you'll drive up, you'll look over, and then stop and, and, and stand over here, and you'll watch all these people from Ohio coming over, you know, they'll look over. Everyone turns away with a smile on their face. You know, everybody looks down and says, you've got to be kidding me. You know, I came all the way from the Mississippi River for this. But, but, uh, I, think, but I think it represents something more than that, I think, and you know that it represents that grit and determination and uh, the faith that they had. Uh, that's really a symbol, and that's why it's included in the painting, which uh, many would say that symbol is, is that of myth. And yet, it's in there for those specific reasons, and it's part of a historically accurate now piece. Right there on the same, um, same grounds, they have Bradford, uh, and they have Massasoit. And you can see they're both very impressive uh, monuments, and uh, worthy of, of the, the, the characters in, in uh, history that they are. Some, some talk about Massasoit, Chief Massasoit, obviously, and, and it's spelled that way, In uh, Governor Bradford spells it that way, so I'm going to guess that it was pronounced Massasoit. You know, there's some discussion, you'll hear some people say Massasoit, uh, but I believe because of the spelling that Bradford used, 
And in, in uh, the native tongue, it's Usamequin, uh, would have been his name, and it stands for yellow feather. It is, it interprets as yellow feather, and I know that because Chief Mills told me that. Uh, Chief Flying Chief Eagle, Flying Eagle uh, Earl Mills Sr., who you may know, uh, said that. So, Bradford and, and Massasoit have this treaty that they do on, Massasoit doesn't show up until March 22nd. Now here they are, they, they land on December 15th, they're in, they're in, uh, uh, they're in from it. So they're there for four months before they see another uh, native. Okay, Massasoit comes over on March 22nd, he sits down with Bradford that afternoon and comes up with a, a simple statement of a treaty. Neither he nor any of his should injure or do any hurt to any of our people. And if any do do of ours, he should send them to the offender that we might punish him. That if any of our tools were taken away, then he should cause them to be restored. Simple Simon stuff. Do unto others. Golden rule. Yeah. Six statements. They're all as simple as that. Uh, that treaty lasted for 50 years. And we know that we know that things got along because of Karen's painting right there. Uh, they had a three-day festival, uh, harvest being gotten in. Our governor sent four men on fowling so that we might, after a special manner, rejoice together. Many of the Indians coming amongst us, and amongst the rest, their greatest King Massasoit, with some 90 men, whom for three days we entertained and feasted. And Karen kept, catches that first day. So one of the things that I incorporated into the presentation upon completion of the painting was a legend. And with the prints, we've done uh, some G. Clay prints. The legend identifies every one of the pilgrims there. And it's uh, an important key to have along with uh, the information. So here's the original painting. And I'm gonna go over a couple, here's the legend to the 1621 painting. And you can use the pointer if you may. Going yeah, right well, in. Why, why don't you? Yeah. I've never used one of these people. There you go. Don't so we have at the uh, head table here, we have Habermark. And we have Standish seated right across from him. Massasoit, we're getting cut off here at the end. But we have Squanto, Massasoit, and Habermark. There's a, an interesting relationship within the tribes, and the relationship between Squanto and Massasoit I found particularly interesting, because in the painting, Squanto is looking away. I purposely had him looking away, uh, because there was a little animosity, a little jealousy, perhaps he wanted to be the great sachem. I know what that means. <laughs> Hurry up. Um, and, but, uh, Massasoit had a huge respect for Habermark. He's looking in Habermark's direction. And Habermark was, um, he had lived with uh, uh, Winslow, or Miles Standish rather. And Miles Standish is seated right opposite him. I have Miles Standish smaller, even seated, but you can see he's smaller in, in, in height and stature. Uh, and Bradford is at the head table here, Winslow. Um, the, and it's cut off again, but you'll see it in the painting. There are two women, this is just kind of a fun fact here, two women who are carrying pies. And speaking of a, something that takes on a life of its own, I had been contacted by Philadelphia Cream Cheese, and Philadelphia Cream Cheese wanted to do a commercial, and so they found those two women in the painting carrying pies, they turned the pies into cheesecake. <laughs> And they called it the Cheesecake Society instead of the Mayflower Society. But it was all done and, and it was very respectfully done. And um, I, I signed on to that for them. And so here we show um, uh, Peregrine and Oceanus. Peregrine being the uh, child that was born at uh, Provincetown Harbor. The cradle is um, one of the uh, pieces left behind. It's at Pilgrim Hall and they, they actually refer to the cradle as um, something that represents the fortitude of the pilgrims. And if I may, some of you met my wife beforehand. This is, she's descended from that kid. 
uh, that, that's resolved white, that's, that's Peregrine's older brother. That's Peregrine white, and this is Oceanus, as uh, Karen mentioned, he born, born at sea just after they left from England. Uh, there. So here we, I, I feel that we're showing truly the American way. And we're showing, uh, well, first of all, the housing is something that the pilgrims were not accustomed to this type of housing. They left behind, by today's standards, their housing was, was quite lovely. And now they're, they've constructed and are living in these timber and daub uh, little buildings. Uh, they've created little garden plotted areas, fenced in areas. Um, a communal spirited, uh, community spirit, and um, you, the, the natives are all positioned in a deliberate stance of caution, perhaps. They're there on guard. They're outnumbering the pilgrims two to one, and as we've often discussed back and forth, with a blink of the eye, everybody could have been gone. Um, but but I, I believe, going back to the compact, there is uh, that spirit of uh, respect, and there is uh, a great respect at the head table here. Um, they're still getting to know each other, they're still feeling a little apprehension going on there in the background, but I feel that, that the painting really has, is, if, if no word was ever spoken, when they say a picture it says a thousand words, the painting speaks those volumes. I'm going to put 10 more words on it. Uh, when, when we talk about Karen being a visual historian. You know, you see the fences. I'm looking at the shallop. Yeah, I was going to pull yeah. You see the shallop is up here on the shore. Over here, you act, actually have the Plymouth Rock. Not too many sailors will pull a ship up to a rock, but OK. Uh, there it is, and, and there's the shallop on the shore. But it conveys the whole thing. This is, this is a clash of cultures. As these, what, these natives stand around, they've never seen a fence before. They've never had to fence an animal. There's three animals right there. They're fenced in. They've never fenced an animal. Uh, they've never seen anything like this. By the same token, the English hadn't seen anything like these quarters either. They look beautiful brick buildings with nice furniture and everything. This is, uh, this is very rough living for, for all of them. Here's those uh, women coming down with the pies right there, sliced there right are. out of the middle. Yes. I mentioned that, you know, the, the culture survives, and we like to think that this is a piece of it. Uh, this tablet right here is, is uh, Massasoit Spring. That, that spring is over in uh, on, on Narragansett Bay. That's where his headquarters was. It's over by Bristol, Bristol Rhode Island. Uh, here you have a plaque that many of you may have seen in Onset, uh, and uh, it says Onset here someplace as soon as I find my, my finger, uh, right there. Uh, we continue to revere his presence. He certainly saw us through. Everything was going fine until King Philip's War. Very interestingly, Massasoit, Bradford, Winslow, they all lived to be about the same age, which was very old for, for in those days. They all lived into their 70s and 80s. Nobody lived that long in those days. Uh, and it was King Philip's son, whose uh, native name was Metacom, uh, and, uh, and Winslow's son, whose name was Edward, became the two protagonists in King Philip's War. As I mentioned to some people, during that war, not a single Cape Cod town was touched. Uh, and that had to be because of the of the uh, the treaty that was made 50 years before, from 1620 to 1675, relatively relative rel peace uh, prevailed. This is somebody. Right here, Dorothy. Deborah has Deborah. seen. Has it? You got you got to hunt for this thing. Yeah. This is out in the middle of the woods. This is the this is where King Philip was was uh, shot. Actually, he was shot by another uh, uh, Indian, another native. Uh, right there in the woods. Here's the sign right here. You know, we were talking at, at lunch. President Nasby landed the Wampanoag. Instead of incorporated, I think right underneath it it should say, since forever. Yeah. You know? yeah. What do we care when it was incorporated? Since forever. You know, and we keep the Mashby Indian house, there it is right there. Uh, 
they, and they, they had uh, Indian preachers back there in 1684. You can see Blind Joseph Amos, Simon Papa Mona. Uh, their own uh, burial ground, I had taken pictures of uh, several, several of the uh, headstones, but I'm not sure that that was a proper thing to do. So now we'll just go with the fact that they do have a cemetery right there. A nice Wampanoag Museum, if you haven't seen that, that's a pretty neat piece. This is the piece Karen did for Mashby. Uh, and that was that was Earl Mills. Uh, yeah, the centerpiece right there. Se centerpiece is him twice. It's it's yeah. him as as the uh, chief and him as the uh, citizen. Again, the survival of two cultures. And you see the meeting house there as well. And and here for the for anybody who might have missed it, here is the Mayflower too coming through the canal just just a couple of weeks ago, totally refurbished. And one of the most exciting things to me was not just in seeing the Mayflower too, but in seeing that fleet. The flotilla of, of everybody you know, you and me out there in a boat, just accompanying the uh, Mayflower through the uh, through the canal. It was really very exciting. All that white water, all those wakes going by, it was pretty thrilling. And it only took like three minutes when it was in front of you. It went by pretty quickly. And that's kind of our story. So, I have a question. what do you got? I wonder how does the Argonauts feel about what you the picture of the. Uh, so when I was doing my research and when I was involved in the painting, I worked with a Wampanoag, one Wampanoag there at Plymouth Plantation, in addition to having spoken to the staff and, and researchers there. But he had given me a lot of information, the things that would be appropriate to put into the painting. And Earl Mills, again, we spoke with him did our homework. As I said, it's a responsibility. You want to get this right. Paula Peters, Karen Mashby, she's very familiar with this. In fact, she requested a slide, an image that she may be able to use in some of her presentations at some point. So, yeah, it, you know, it's it's very it's a sensitive subject. Um, it's it's one it's a story that you want to be able to tell it as accurately as possible. As I said in the opening. And, um, I think it's wonderful what you did. Yeah, but we're, I taught Mashpee for a lot of years. We're very proud and of it. Our children, the, the Native American children in the classroom, were not allowed to celebrate Thanksgiving at all. We were not allowed to do anything about Thanksgiving in the school system. So I'm wondering how this all, how it goes around. So we've we've captured a moment. The painting captures that particular moment when that existed, and it's true that. That's it's beautiful, it's beautiful. I love it, but I just have some questions about it. Yeah, no. You know what? We have uh, Chief Flying Eagle's comment at the very beginning of the book, and he actually sat with us there, down there at Mary Ellen's restaurant, and we kind of talked about it before it went to press. Uh, and his comment is, finally, someone is looking at this period of time with a positive eye. Oh, that's yeah. It is, and, you know, and we're very happy about that because we think it was the clash. The clash was inevitable. How it was resolved was going to determine what happened next. And the clash was resolved in that treaty of March 22nd. Right then and there, the day Massasoit met, met Bradford, they said, "Here's going to be the rules." Same thing that Bradford did before they left the Mayflower. You know, we're not going to have anarchy. We're not going to have a monarchy. We just got to figure this out among ourselves. And, and they got together with Massasoit. And, and Chief Mills was very happy that we, we gave them that piece of credit that said, yeah, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for them. It was going to be inevitable, whether it happened in Salem or it happened in Connecticut or it happened in New York. Somewhere along the line, somebody was going to discover America and be here. And for 50 years, it worked. And that's good to hear. I just, well. just had, I just had those yeah. questions because of being in the I, I wanted to read this to you because um, I think it addresses some of those points too. So I had written to Dr. Jeremy Bangs, who um, many of you may have heard of. He's the director of the Pilgrim uh, Museum in Leiden. And um, Jeremy wrote back, uh, this was in February, your attempt to emphasize the presence of Pakanakit Indians in your painting of 1621 Thanksgiving is admirable and has attracted attention since the painting was first displayed at Pilgrim Hall. I've noticed it's continuing exhibition here and there in frequent use in online publications. So it's nice to learn that it is again on display. So as I said, it's on display at the Falmouth Historical Society. Come on down and see it. Thank you. 
Hi. Uh, my question, I'd like to know a little bit about more of the people who came on the law. Uh, we know that they came for, for religious freedom. Uh, but were some of those people debtors uh, from debtors' prison that were on the boat? They, they were strangers. And when you talk about them, why they came is kind of an interesting thing. Basically, it was a pilgrimage. It was another pilgrimage. Uh, that took them to say, if we're going to have this congregation and we're going to have religion the way we want to, we'll go someplace else to do it. But it wasn't necessarily to fight for religious freedom because they had that in Holland. What they were losing was their Englishness. Uh, and, and they were beginning to feel that they had just raised their kids. I mean, think of yourselves being away from where you were for 10 years when you're 12 years old. You never, the kids were growing up and had no idea of where England was, what, what England was. and that kind of bothered the pilgrims. Now, when they set sail, they, they went to go on the speedwell, which is a smaller ship and it, it, it leaked like a sieve. So they, they stopped in uh, England on the way over. They were going to set, come in two ships. The, two, the speedwell continued to take on water until the, they came back again. And now it's becoming September, uh, trying to cross the Atlantic. Things are getting tough. They come back and they load up. Now some of the congregants had said, I don't really want to go anymore. You know, I've been, you know, enough of this. So, but they had the ship, and they had to fill it. So they had, the, they had Miles Standish, and they had a couple of his soldiers and so forth. So yes, then they became strangers, they, they're called, uh, as they go to separate these fellows. Uh, and I, I don't know that they necessarily filled it up with debtors' prison or any of those sorts of things. Uh, it does call them strangers. It, there are adventurers, which are people who are going over to see what products they can get or what, what uh, native goods that they might have that they could sell and those sorts of things. But I don't recall anything uh, in the narratives that I've read that says that they were necessarily, you know, prison. Yeah, the fact that they were prisoners and who was the minister, were they followers of John Calvin? Uh, I mean, because, you know, there were different religious sects. So yeah, yeah Calvin. Brown is Right. They weren't necessarily Calvinists, they were Congregationalists, and that's why they gave Karen this uh, task to paint something that was a gift to the nation. They were Congregationalists, and, and their tagline is the Pilgrim's Church. Uh, and they believed that if it wasn't in the Bible, then, then it had no place in the liturgy. And so there's no mention of vestments, there's no mention of, of the church hierarchy. It's really love thy neighbor type stuff. And so they would work among themselves. Uh, and that was their religion that they were practicing was the Bible. And that's why you see it so full of Bible quotes and they're always quoting the Bible. It's because they lived it. That was their, their guidance. So I don't think Calvin entered into it. I mean, Calvin and Luther and, and, and Wesley comes along a few years later and so forth. Uh, there, there was sex breaking off of it, but no, I think the pilgrims were, were pretty much... Yeah, well, you know, people, one of the pages in the text here talks about pilgrims, puritans, and profiteers, you know, and, and they get conflated. And when people start complaining about what happened up at Corn Hill, they say they stole their corn, and they start making this into a negative. But Karen, I think, stressed very nicely that these guys are starving. They've been 66 days at sea. People are dying at sea. They're dying of scurvy. They haven't had a fresh drink of water. They haven't had fresh food for, for weeks on end. And so now, I think that because it was written at the contemporary time, they found the corn, they dug the corn, they ate the corn. And they, and they said among themselves, if we find the guy who, had, who planted this corn, we'll make, make good for it. And sure enough, about six months later, Chief Aspinet, who was the chief of the Nossets, shows up with the Billington boy. Yeah. Karen paints very, very coyly, hiding behind one of the buildings, because he building. was kind of a tough kid. Yeah. Uh, and, and Aspenet shows up with, with, the, uh, with the Billington boy, yeah. and they make restitution. They then. make restitution right then and there, and, and it's over. Uh, but yeah, they, they took the corn because if they hadn't eaten that corn, we we kind of call that a hallmark, hallmark moment. <laughs> a, a hallmark <laughs> moment. Kind of. Yeah. Does that help? And, it, that, and that's kind of what the book is, and it's written in vignette form. I mean, everything we've just talked about, you know, we, we kind of write it as vignettes. 
Uh, we try to present it uh, chronologically because it's easier to follow, but that's, that's kind of what we did, and that's what we spent the last year doing. So we hope you enjoyed it, and uh, please, 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 please.